Peace, peace. We are back once again with Masterminds of Brother Shamel. I'm your host, Brother Shamel, and we are back from a hiatus of doing these interviews and these live streams. And I'm I'm always honored and pleased to have this guest on. Um, you, you heard from him earlier this year where he dropped something serious for you. And we're back again to discuss some something that you may want to hear about about the state of today's music specifically hip-hop um none other than my brother Asir the duke of tears he's brother glad to have you on i want to um absolutely brother i want to um before we get in i want to kind of give some um announcements first off uh for on my end um I have a audio book that I just completed. Production is done. Uh, right now we're in the review stage and we're looking to do some distribution. That's for my book, What is the Higher Self? So be on the look for that. No. Appreciate it. As far as my brother, Asir, no absolutely gratitude. I got, definitely check him out. His cash app for those who want to donate is dollar sign DS418. If you want to give a donation to the brother, because he's putting out this work, um, he's dropping some serious uh, videos on YouTube and on Rumble, and um, he'll go ahead and give that as well. But definitely support the brother, as well as check out um, his other half, his lovely wife, Cordoba, uh, Selena Cordoba, Il, her uh, website, which is CordobaOrganics.com. That's C O R. D O B A organics.com. She has some excellent, excellent um, products as far as hair and skin. I tried it myself, so you definitely want to check that out as well. And um, I'll let my brother Asir go ahead and, and plug the rest before we jump right in. Uh, yeah, man. You definitely want to check those out. Um, it's very good for everybody's uh, physical development. And uh, my sister works real hard, you know, to bring something that has no uh, additives, preservatives, poisons, chemicals and stuff. So definitely want to give her honors and respect for that, you know, because there's very few people that's out here actually doing it directly like that. So definitely want to give her uh, respect for that. So please definitely check out www.cordoborganics.com. And uh, thank you for having me on, bro. My pleasure, brother. Always, always a pleasure. Um, with that, with that said, um, when I spoke, when we spoke uh, some time ago, I said I wanted to touch base with you and really speak on today's music, uh, specifically hip hop. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to touch on um, the hip hop industry. We know this is supposed to be um, what they call the fiftieth, supposedly the fiftieth yeah. anniversary. Right of yeah. hip hop, and we can go into that as well. But right. you know, there's been a lot of things going on, as right. you know, and I wanted your take on it. Now, to give the people some background of why I connected with you, one thing I know that you you've done music. You know, everybody it's on record. People can go on YouTube, check the videos of the, of the music that you've done, um, as well as there's some some other things that you share with me in terms of uh, your background. So I want to um, allow you to share people your background in the, in the hip hop industry and, um, you know, how you, how you get to be able to speak on what you, what you're about to speak on tonight. Indeed. Indeed. Okay. Uh, well, thank you again. Um, I came up um, like everybody we, I was born in the same year that allegedly hip hop allegedly began, which we'll say is around 73. However, the seeds of it started before, you know what I mean? Back in, I would say anywhere between 69 and 70, 69 and 73 was like the, the birthplace of what we would perceive as hip hop to be today. You know what I mean? And this was coming out of the, 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 uh, specific death of disco which was killed on purpose enabled so that way a new 
version and type of music could happen because we were now at this time as a species in the in like the first quarter of what they would call the age of Aquarius. We wasn't fully in it, but you know, it was still coming. So um, my father, bless the dead, Charles Rogers Sr., he um, was always into music coming up. Um, in the army, he was, um, when he got drafted, he wound up going in and uh, became a, uh, he was a cook in it. But he used to write songs and all of that stuff while he was, you know, doing stuff in the mess and feeding the men and all of that. So when he came back, he had a specific um, goal in mind to get involved with the music industry. So long story short, he um, started to work at um, a record a college radio station. He became a DJ. He had a show called the Charles Rogers Express. Anyway, um, from what I can remember, this was around the time, this was like right I was born in 73, but I could remember real early, like him taking me to the radio station with him or whatever, you know what I'm saying? And stuff like that, like being around eight track tapes and records and you know what I'm saying? Like that was always around. Plus my mother and he used to do singing at churches and stuff when they was, when they was younger, prior to them blinking up. So, through him, you know, bless, bless you. Through him, I was able to get a real sense of what music was was like. You know what I mean? Because all they listened to was like what all of our parents listened to. You know what I'm saying? Isaac Hayes and um, everything. So by the time the blackout happened, which I remember in '77, by the time that happened, um, he had lost that gig and he had he was being a drummer. So around that time, he decided to go and enroll in school so he could get a communications degree. And then from there, he parlayed that into um, business management, um, excuse me, into um, <clears throat> like DJing, like, you know what I'm saying? So from there, he met Vaughn Harper, who used to run, um, who used to be one of the big voices on um, WBLS when it was a so-called black station. And um, he started uh, writing, he started writing for the Amsterdam News. So I was very young. I remember walking up them long stairs. If anybody ever been to the Amsterdam News building when it was there, it used to be like these long stairs you had to walk up. It was like seen forever. Anyway, I remember going with him, meeting, art meeting artists, you know what I'm saying? But then um, by around the time, I started to really be interested in music was around the time of the victory tour when I was able to go with him, you know, like backstage and shit and like meet like, you know what I'm saying? Like the Jacksons and like, you know what I'm saying? All of that was like real enticing to music. I remember meeting them to make Grant, now Rogers, like a lot of these people and I was very young. Um, because every time I would meet, cause him and my moms had broke up. so. When I would meet him, he would all like it would be like us together, but it would also be like a working thing. Cause he, you know what I'm saying, he gotta hustle. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So long story short, he started a um publicity firm. And then from there, he was became the backbone for all of the the hip hop magazines that started to come out after that. So like right when so between the era of like Brock Kim and try for quest the low end theory that era was like around the time i was really um thrust with music because in able and him being a publicist and stuff they always want their artists to have the best publicity so i would be getting so you know he'd be getting free records free um you know all types of stuff from different labels and stuff so i'm hearing music from all over the place you know what i'm saying especially hip-hop you know what I mean? Because hip hop is now starting to really burgeon and now it's starting to split from hip hop into rap. We we are now going where a lot of the Hispanic, so-called Hispanic people, people who refer to themselves as Latino people, they started veering off and going more into the cultural aspect of it. So they start going more into the dance, more into the 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 art, which is like the graffiti and um the um 
like the fashionable, let's say, side. You know what I'm saying? Whereas a lot of the so-called melanated, predominantly, you know, darker brown skin, these type of people, we get more into DJing, producing, uh, and specifically lyricism and rapping. You know what I'm saying? So I'm seeing all of this happen. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I remember, you know, I I would like, like, I like poor righteous teachers, but at the same time, I liked um, Divine Style, or, you know what I mean? Or, you know, I would listen to the nonce because they reminded me of De La Soul. Or I would like, you know what I'm saying? Like, a regional, I really didn't care. I just liked how it was, you know, if it was good rap, I wasn't caught up necessarily the way a lot of MCs in New York out when I came up with, they was really caught up in like New York being the only type of thing. But I'm like, if you're not from New York, you can't really fault somebody from not sounding like New York. So I knew that very early. Plus my father, like I said, and my mother was very, you know, versatile when it comes to music. So a lot of those magazines, he became the head of all of these magazines under the name Chuck Chill Out or, or Chuck Chill or whatever. He, um, used to be the writer, editor in chief of shit like um write on, fresh, word up, like all of those like teeny rapper, bopper, teeny bopper rap uh communication type magazines. He was in that. So by the time now the source and all of that comes in, all the while now, me personally, I'm learning the backside of the industry, seeing how things is, because around to this time he's also managing a sister named MC Trouble, blessed the dead, uh, Latasha Rogers from um, Los Angeles, who was a real powerful MC, man. She was really dope. And um, she really laid the groundwork, influenced a lot of females that was coming out of um, so-called LA at the time. So that gave me, you know, another view of that whole thing. Cause by the t at the time of her death, she was working with two uh, Q-Tip and he had produced like two songs, two or three songs from her. One of the songs is actually on the house party soundtrack and my father singing on the on the hook. It's called Big Old Jazz, that song. So big up to her, big up to him. And um, you know, I'm trying to striving to get my rap thing on, but I decided it might be easier to really learn like the the literary aspect of the game. So that's when um around high school and all of that, I met a sister named um Sonia. Sonia Majette, peace to her. And then she knew another sister named Kieran Mayo, who was an editor in um, The Source. And uh, she was telling me they was looking for young writers and stuff. So I started, I did like a, I did like a modeling thing first with them. And then I was able to submit stories. And then one of the stories got picked up and we got real big, which led me to do like two or three more of them under the name Destiny, because that was also the name I was rapping under. So uh, that story was called Booster Shots, and it was all about the polo, all about the low lives and the whole um, low life boosting culture that was like real heavy in New York at the time. Big up to the low lives, big up to um, to all of them, you know, Thurston and all of them. Um, and then right in that story, it got real, I got a lot of good feedback from that. And that allowed me to start writing for other magazines like Rap Pages. I don't think that exists no more. Um, Rap Pages, The Source, The Ghetto Times. Um, I wrote for a lot of man, a lot of little joints like that. As well as doing bios and stuff for up and coming artists like, uh, I did that Press First bio, Big Up to Stick and M. Uh, did uh, a lot of people, uh, Ultra Magnetic, uh, I remember interviewing them for like different, um, you know, just throughout the game, just meeting different people. But at the same time, I was kind of young. So I'm peeping it from the perspective of like soaking a game up and then trying to figure out like what's going to be my end or our end. Because at the time I was in a group, what's going to be our end into the game. You know what I'm saying? And um, it wasn't until Trouble died of a so-called epileptic seizure that's when i started to notice like stuff started being different and started noticing my pops like start to recoil with me traveling with him and being around certain people and stuff like that and i also noticed how they would like deal with my pops like he had more relationships with like the inner workers of the people making certain decisions but most of them were female 
because I noticed a lot of the males that was in the game, they was like, seemed like they was like really clicked up in different things. And a lot of these clicks, a lot of these dudes was like real effeminate, you know what I'm saying? So I remember just peeping game like that early. So around the time he started doing um, publicity work for Immature, that was when um, he started letting me know like, yeah, like, like Chris Stokes and all of that. Like I had been hearing about stuff like that for years. The Bambada stuff, I had been hearing about that. You know what I'm saying? For a long time. So by the time it actually became now news, if you understand, I'm already, I'm entrenched in it. Like I'm starting to get my music out. Uh, I grew up next door to a brother, a, a great DJ, a brother named DJ Spinner, who had a, a group called the Jig Masters, big up to them. And, uh, I remember, you know, going to him when the MPs and all that first came out doing like tapes on cassettes, like trying to do demos and all of that. So, you know, I learned the craft early, like what, how to count bars, uh, what sampling is about, like how to, you know, how to take one riff from another one, bass lines, um, um, cadence, like all of this type of stuff that nobody really taught us. We just, you just pick it up as you, you're going, you know what I mean? And I just so happened to be at the Mecca of hip hop at the time, which was, you know, New York, specifically Brooklyn, big up Brooklyn. So by the time now the death row East Coast, West Coast thing happened, and now I'm at the source, I'm like maybe four stories in. Um, and I remember them like people calling, like them getting death threats, like, <laughs> it's like this shit was crazy. And then I remember when Benzino came and then did the whole takeover of that. Like it, it was like a takeover. And then like all the real like literary people that was there, like I said, people like uh, Kieran, Kieran and Mayo, people like um, James Bernard, um, forget some of the other ones, um, Matt, Matt and D, like a lot of these people, you know, had gone because that generation was like the, that generation of people who had just come out of, you know, college and wasn't getting jobs at places like, you know, Vibe or these other magazines. So they basically started it like that, literally from nothing, like a newsletter. And so watching the magazine go to the point where they used to do Islamic summits, because at one point people don't remember, like Islam or Islamic thought, like, like prevailed in hip hop for years. You understand? For years, where like, if they wasn't Muslims or Moors, they was um, Nuwapians, but well, they wasn't Nuwapians at the time. They was um, Nubian Islamic Hebrews, you know what I'm saying? And things like that. You know, you had people like Lakim Shabazz and big up to DJ Mark the 45 King. He just passed. So, you know, seeing it going through it and at the same time learning about the 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 inner workings of how corrupt it was. I started to see that when it started to start to change and start to go from C from like records and tapes to like CDs, I started seeing like the mass firings and everything that went along with that. And like how many people had to be downsized and moved and how they would put like people who had no regard for hip hop or whatever, put them in, um, positions to lord over like new acts that they really had no understanding of you know what i'm saying like so in watching all of that it wasn't until i think a little after tupac uh after the source collapsed that's when uh, I started to see the writing on the wall with a lot of the rap stuff because I started to see that a lot of people I knew that was coming up and were actually signed. They were signed in an early point where there was still people passionate about the music, signing people and all that. You know what I'm saying? Because like, I remember going to school with rappers. Like I went to school with Kwame, with Sticky Fingers, with Havoc and Prodigy. Like literally, like we were all in the same school type shit. You know what I'm saying? And that's how it was back then. Because back then you had, like I said, a heavy concentration of like low lot, like different crews, like low lots and Autobots and Decepticons and, 
and water columns, and, you know what I'm saying? And then you had different high schools where you would go to different high schools based upon your affiliation, you know what I mean? So a lot of DCEPs and water columns and them was out at like, uh, what was that, Peace Channel, as well as like printing. These are high schools back then. And, you know, but then a lot, but then everybody would meet up at like Irvin or Mary Bertram. You see what I'm saying? And then you would have MC battles and stuff like that. But it became a lot less breaking, like all of the breaking and all that shit. Like, like a lot of the people I knew stopped a lot of that around the time that like Rakim and them came out. Because if you notice, even in the music, a lot of MCs still had dancers. You know what I'm saying? But around the time Rakim started coming out and we start going into people like epmd and these type of people whatever a lot of the dancing kind of got phased out because even epmd had dances you know what i'm saying like everybody had dance at one point but at after a certain point when it was obvious that the rapper and the dj were now the commoditized way that we're going to propel you know the the genre that's when the fork split you know what I mean? That's when, you know, like I said, a lot of the Latinos and them, they really went heavy with kept keeping the break in and a lot of the cultural graffiti and a lot of that stuff a lot. People like, you know, Phase Two and um even Ramalizi. Like people be sleeping. Everybody talk about old school hip hop, but everybody leave out like Ramalizi, these type of people who have profound impact on the culture. You know what I mean? People that's like unsung, like like just ice for instance just you know random people that we don't even hear about no more but it was like their records were or what they did was in such a way it helped fuel what was going on you know what i mean and like i said once rap and and um dj and that became a thing that was viable for people that looked like us specifically who invented it and now could now be the new jackson five or the new barry white or whatever we jumped on that. You see what I'm saying? And then that's when it split. Meanwhile, though, you still have real dope like hip hop uh, groups that happen to be Hispanic. But we never, but I never, maybe, let me speak for myself. I never looked at them like, oh, I never looked at somebody like, oh, well, because they're this, they can't do that. Not really was on it like that. Because, like I said, I came up with, we all came up together. So anybody who's into old school hip hop, like you, you remember Charlie Chase, like you remember a lot of these these brothers, sisters that um was in the trenches with us with that. But you still had groups like Beat Nuts, who nobody talk about, which is in, which is insane, because you know uh, if it wasn't for Beat Nuts, there would be no Cypress Hill. You know what I'm saying? If it wasn't no Cypress Hill, there'd be no Alchemist. You know what I'm saying? But people don't know that Alchemist and James Kahn, the actor, his son used to be in a rap group called the Hooligans. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I know because I did their first bio. I was one of the uh, people they sent their first little um, tape to for whatever le record label they was on at the time. You know what I'm saying? So this is what I'm saying. Like, like people don't know Andrew Brody used to do beats. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, Leonardo DiCaprio used to, like, do uh, breakdance battles and shit like that. Like this, is, like they always in it, you know? So, but there was always the understanding of who were the progenitors, who are the, the founders of this thing and where it came from. And it came from a place of oppression and struggle and from a time of what they call, uh, uh, what is it, what were they called it? Urban Black or or uh, something neglect, urban neglect. There was a word that they had for it. And that- Benign, ne out. benign neglect, neglect, was that it? Say again? Benign neglect? Benign neglect, yes. Mondale, yeah. yes. Walter yeah. Mondale, that was the, the piece of crap that coined <laughs> that and, and brought that to the forefront. And then that became the basis of, of all of that. One of the best movies that could surmise what it was like to live at that time was movies like The Warriors, movies like Wild Style. You know what I'm saying? Like, you gotta understand, like, at that point, 
like growing up, there were certain points in the Bronx and Brooklyn where it was like bombed out. It was like, <laughs> cause from the riots, they never built nothing up. You see what I'm saying? From the riots when they killed King. So we're growing up in this. They done took all of the programs out. They done convinced the black woman to take the, 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 the uh, debate in kicking the man out the house so they could get the welfare and now the, the white man the government become the father like they they did all of that so we're the last human generation you understand generation x like everybody talk about the millennials and generation z but in between all of that there's us <laughs> there's generation x we were the last or are the last human generation we are the world's last hope because we are the ones to remember music before rap. We could listen to a music today on a commercial and know what rap song that commercial sampled it from and then what sample that commercialized version come from and who made it <laughs> when it came out, you understand? So we remember what it was like not to have nothing. You see what I'm saying? Like we was the last generation really not to have nothing where nobody looked out for us, where they had to make, they had to make commercials that asked, it's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your parents are? Cause they didn't know who we was. We would just be out. We would just be out in the street. I remember riding when I first got my first bike. And then back in Brooklyn at this time, I don't know, they used to have these wrenches, these these little silver like wrenches where you turn the back and everybody would have these wrenches. So I remember for whatever reason, I was obsessed with getting this wrench because I never had this wrench. So one day I got the wrench, right? Now I got the wrench, I'm on the block with everybody, we all got the bikes. We gonna ride now because the wrench was like, if your bike got messed up or whatever, you could fake fix it, whatever we was doing, you know, the kids, children. I remember riding to the point where we didn't even know what we was, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And there was no phone, like it was a, there was a uh, pay phone, but who got a quarter for that? You know what I'm saying? We didn't, we didn't spend the quarter, we didn't spend that on chips and quarter waters and all that. So I remember, so we would have to find our way back home. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like we would play outside for hours, but then knew, okay, the light hitting is getting dark. Let me go home, check in, go home, eat. And then some of us could go back outside until 11. Like. This is the type of life we was living, you know what I'm saying? So, in essence, that gave us a certain appreciation for life, you understand? That was reflective in the music that we had. Like, in our era, we was dancing in clubs, right? But what Goody Mob told us, they don't dance no more, <laughs> right? Right? Because all of the music stopped being danceable and started being more cerebral. And then once it got internal and cerebral, that's when it started bringing the megahertz down to then make it down. So even all of the up music, because they used the words like drop it low, get it low, get it down, face down, up, down. You see what I'm saying? You still being drawn down because a meeting was had. And at that meeting, a bunch of rappers who at the time were at the top of the game were were boycotting Grammys was getting stuff done and somebody decided that the record labels needed to win, invest in private prisons and they needed these rappers to start to go a criminality route with their raps and from that point on it became about Hip hop became about now expressing the the urban hatred, not the conditions. See, we was see Melly Mel and them was talking about the conditions, like you know what I'm saying, broken glass everywhere, people pissing on the ground, and they just don't care. Like he's talking about the conditions of everything. You know what I'm saying? He's talking about how things are, but when you hear, you know you know, uh, even Schooly D, PSK for making that dream. People always wonder what the hell does that mean? Everybody want to talk about NWA being the fathers of gangster rap and all of that, but the true gangster, 
gangster rap and all like that started in Philly with trap facts. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. With, with yeah. Cooley, Steady B, Cool C. These niggas was real gangsters. These niggas was robbing banks. They, do, they doing time they, now. They doing time now for this shit. I remember going buying Steady B record from Beach Street in Brooklyn, across the street from Abbey Square Mall. That Biz did the record about. Like, you understand what I'm saying? Like, I remember seeing Biz in the mall. I remember seeing Hawk and Biz and Kane and and um Wolf and all these niggas there. And I'm young. You understand? Like, like I'm young, young shorty in it. Like, yo, like what's this is rap. Like, this is real rap. Like at any given moment, you see one of these things. You know what I'm saying? So it also lessened the starstruck thing as well, knowing also then finding out that a lot of these niggas is not writing their raps and, you know, you got ghost writers and all of that. And then when you get into, you know, all of the pandering, that's when I started, you know, as I got older, I started to realize, okay, well, maybe getting a deal and doing it the way that I thought I was going to do it is not the way to do it. You know what I'm saying? Do you really like the music or are you trying to be famous? Because if you really like the music, then you could just make make music and put it out how you want. You know what I'm saying? And it get to who it get to and inshallah you do shows or whatever. And I decided that that was better for me. So that's what that's what I did. You know, and then from there, um, it was really good because I was then able to fuse music with art and I started doing like fine art stuff as a camera too, because thankfully I was able to know how to teach and stuff. So I started working in a lot of after school programs, you know what I'm saying? And as well as day school programs when they would need like little substitutes and stuff. So there were different arts organizations that were basically fronts, which are basically like money laundering fronts for rich uh, so-called uh, Jewish people to be able to, um, you know, show that they still about community service, you know? So, um, in doing that, I was, I learned that side of the game, you know what I mean? Like what seemed what the education wise was doing to the children and how, and I'm seeing how, how this criminalization factor that was now instigated into the music is now warping these young children. Cause now I'm old enough to do the knowledge to all of this. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I, I know discernment now. I know, okay, I was there for the change when it flipped up. So I can't act like I don't see the debilitating effects that it's had. And then when I found out about the meeting from somebody that allegedly was there and then found out that all these labels was invested in private prisons and that a lot of these major so-called mogul artists was invested in the same prisons and it was advantageous for them to help commune and get more people and urge our people to be more self-destructive i started to that's what opened me up now okay there's something else going on there's a broader thing at play and now knowledge itself that had already been there you see what i'm saying whether it was you know the so-called black power phase consciousness right that's let's say the x-clan phase excuse me public enemy phase right then I go into the heavy black power phase. That's the whole X clan, you know, poor righteous teachers, brand new being, you know, all of that. Then I start going back and listening to people like Two Kings and the Cypher and Lakim Shabazz and stuff, Guru and these people saying and noticing like these dudes has got feathers on in the videos. You know what I'm saying? Then I'm starting to get knowledge itself now in terms of more science. And then that's what brings it all full circle. Cause now I'm seeing, okay, the circle seven is, this is where the, the 5% and then this is where, okay. And this, and then it all just starts jumping. It doesn't become repulsive. The information no longer becomes repulsive. I'm not looking at it from a secretarian position now. Now I'm really seeing like, okay, this is really how and what hip hop is in the essence. It was a means for us to re establish who we are in terms of an identity that is outside of the normal parameters of information we would get in any other venue and that's when i started to see how sacrosanct 
uh, hip hop really was and why it now was being destroyed, you know what I mean, and turned into what it is now. You know what I'm saying? Indeed, indeed. Now, I wonder, because you basically gave like a whole history pretty much of hip hop, pretty much up until the day from your experience. And uh, I wanted to touch on, because you, you addressed it, like the Islamic influence. Me, just coming from my background, I was raised up in Long Island. I was born in Queens, but raised up in Long Island. So wow. like you, as a matter of fact, Roosevelt and Freeport. So I used to see Flavor Flav yeah. driving a beat up Nova. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I used to see these guys. And um, Islam was very heavy, like you said, whether it was... Five percenters, five percenters were deep everywhere. Yep. Nation of Islam. Yep. I used to see the, the Ansars. You were saying the Wabians, they were yep. Ansars back then. Ansars, all, yep. all this was a great influence. So, from your perspective, where was the kind of the shift? What I saw, like, for example, like, like Big Daddy Kane. Mm -hmm. Big Daddy Kane, Rock him. I kind of seen like where R and B kind of came in, where R and B started accepting hip hop. Yes, and kind of and kind of shifted things. From your yes. perspective and your knowledge, where did you see where there was less influence? Because maybe the last impact of Islam influence of any kind was Wu Tang. Yeah, and it was because of um, Freedom yep. of Love, Papa yep. Wu. So where did you see the shift coming for you? Same thing. Um, they tried to soft shoe it with the uh, they tried to soft shoe it with the R and B, um, using people like Teddy Riley, uh, with the New Jack Swing and all that. Like I remember the day he was filming the Groove Me video. Like I was about to cut class to go. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like this is how crazy shit is. Like I the day and all of that, but I don't know something happened one of our friends got jumped or something like that and then uh we didn't go but um yeah it was like a it, it was like hip-hop it's like guy kind of like guy and rex in effect they kind of like started to to excuse me let me not even say that before all of them heavy d big up to heavy d b heavy d man another unsung person that they really don't be trying to like put on like that but heavy d was real dope yo like his he he not only was a great rapper but he he was an all-around good so-called good person and um he did a lot for hip-hop in terms of like uh espousing it to people who weren't in the culture like he was a great orator in that way like what you see fat Jew, fat fat Jew, fat joe doing now um that's that's what um that's what heavy d used to do you know what i'm saying like he was like that and um i started from there though like i said once like when schoolie was doing what he was doing with the psk thing and all of that that was still kind of underground. So around the time that Colors came out and Ice-T was talking that, you know, all of that uh, six in the morning police at my door, that's PSK. Six in the morning police at my door when the sun was running playing on my bathroom floor, right? PSK for making that dream. People always wonder what the hell does that mean? You know what I'm saying? Like all of this stuff, as much as people want to hate on New York and shit, like if it wasn't for us developing this thing in that, in that whole tri-state area, that whole little East Coast hub, the rest of the world wouldn't have this. So they had to find a way to slow it down. And like I said, start to veer people into, into associating hip hop and rap with criminality. And then by proxy associating the people who do hip hop and rap as criminals. You see what I'm saying? Because now once we're desensitized as criminals, we're not going to see them as artists or poets or potential uh, 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 doom criers as to what is wrong with society. You see what I'm saying? So it wasn't until they started doing that that they started going heavy. So they start going out West Coast 
and then now they start to create the gangster rap thing to go specifically against the movement in New York, in in the East Coast, which was still about music, it was still about lyrics, which is still about whether you could rap or not. You know what I'm saying? It was the bar. It was like boxing. Like at one point, boxing could not go any further because everybody that was boxing that was melanated was the dominant for everything. So they had to almost dummy down the sport, you know what I'm saying? Slow it down. Or matter of fact, they created a pseudo sport. They they flipped that. They said, okay, well, we can't, the black man, we can't beat the black man in this. So we're going to beat them in UFC. See what I'm saying? So now mixed martial MMA, mixed martial arts. Now, you know, it's everything, whatever. Then they can start dominating that. <laughs> so now they got to slow that down. And now they done linked it up with Bud Light, you see what I'm saying, to get rid of all of the hardcore heterosexuals that still might find it um, appealing. Because the goal in all of this, especially with the hip-hop thing, was to criminalize the archetype of the original man. And to make him somebody that you'll listen to as entertainment, but you never take seriously, which always will allow him to be taken out. And thus... um, when you initiated that, you created a whole genre of copycat people. But let's not say it was copycat. Let's just say that once NWA came out, it let other people with criminal tendencies know that there was another way that they could exhibit these criminal tendencies without going to jail. So in one way, it's good. Because a lot of these groups that came out after NWA weren't good. You know what I'm saying? But because they talked that gangster shit, because... They was, they was, you know, loped out and connected, you know what I mean, with an outfit or, or a set or whatever that allowed them to, to sustain themselves. So in that case, it's good. But what it did was it criminalized an entire generation or let's say the last, let's say from Easy e and them, let's say five generations have all been criminalized since then. And look, and we can parallel it. All you got to do is look at the rise of how many blacks and these people going to jail from the time that this thing came out. You know what I'm saying? And you'll see that there's a statistic correlation because so-called black people, unfortunately, because they have no knowledge of self and because they think they know more than they actually know, are susceptible, uh, excuse me, are very impressionable. You know what I mean? Especially when it comes to things that they feel is belongs to them. So all you got to do is couch whatever propaganda in something that you know they want to hear. And you can do anything. So I can't talk about killing, you know, Indian people or or, or whoever or raping white women or whatever on, on record right now. And I expect that play. But I can make a record about uh, brutalizing a black woman, pimping a pimping a black woman, uh, uh, robbing a man, uh, holding his family for ransom. So long as they look like me, I can do that. So, with, with, who made that unspoken rule a fact? Right? And like I said, it, when we if we were to extrapolate and go back to where that initial thought come from, it didn't come from nobody that looked like us. But somebody that looked like us sat right there with somebody that didn't and accepted that proposition so long as it benefited them. And that's why we, as a collective people, are not going to be able to rise beyond the traitors that will always sell us out. Absolutely. And when you said that, the, the thought that came to mind was Ice Cube. For the example, when you mentioned about with N.W.A., you know, like you said, as long as they were talking the gangsterism against our own, it was cool. Yeah, when yeah. he left out yeah. and he got with public with enemy, Hank yeah, Hank Shockley and all of them, then he put out, um, even with the disc record that he put out, No Vaseline, where yeah. he said, with a white Jew telling you what to do, yeah. that, was, that was something that he wasn't according to the powers that be, he wasn't supposed to say anything like that. Then he did a, a song about Koreatown and all of that. All so, of that. On a death certificate. Them first yeah, two albums. Yep. Them first two albums be um, America's Most, because that's what that's what 
brought that's what that's what opened up uh la rap to new york to the east coast america's most like i said that was done by the bomb squad the bomb squad could do no wrong at the time they had everything out they had all the public enemy albums out they had that that deep that terminator x album valley of the jeep beats right that was bumping for like two summers um they was doing they did son of berserk <laughs> you know what i'm saying like bomb squad was was wild so that america's most album there's there's really no very few albums that's as good as that whether it be east coast or west coast however we can claim that because it had a east coast East Coast sound, but it had a West Coast doodle, and that's why Cube was smart. You see what I'm saying? He was smart. And he was smart enough to stand on his own at a time when they were trying to push the conformity uh, box on us. And that delayed their plans, believe it or not, for at least a couple of years, the way that they really wanted to go. But remember, once Easy E got that letter back from the FBI and it went to Ronald Reagan's situation, it was a wrap. That was a sign for us to let you know that, you know, they was now down with the program, that somebody is is funding them, and that this might just be a whole hip hop itself, rap itself might have been a whole psychological operation from the beginning. Because remember, I told you, that's what all the music in the 60s was about. Right. All of them LSD, drug, ayahuasca music, laced up, drugged up music, right? They started in the end, middle of the 60s, and by the end of the 60s, look, they, they killed Bobby, Johnny, Malcolm, Martin, Medga, right? They turned the hippies, which was the almost looking like as the Jesus whole race of like Jesus Christ type niggas, right? They turned all of them niggas into drug addicts, right? And then culminated the whole end of the 60s with the destruction and the mayhem of Woodstock. Remember that? All them people just, just uh, what you call it. And so that ended that. So the energy, though, that energy was still pervasive and it was still going to manifest as something else. I don't think they knew it was hip hop or it would be hip hop or whatever, but whatever it was. That blackout, the blackout of 77, that was the precursor for hip hop, for the birth of what we call hip hop, because everybody got their equipment from there. So that blackout the next day gave birth to like a thousand DJs, you know what I'm saying? Which then gave birth to like hundreds of MCs, which then gave birth to hundreds of, of, of block parties, which then started the dancing, which then started the graffiti, you see what I'm saying? So whether it was a, a, a perfect storm or man-made or whatever it was, it did, ch we changed the world because we created hip hop. We are the ones, those of us that was out there on the street, on the cardboard with the linoleum, tagging up the train yards. Like I was out, we was out there. We was, I told you, our generation was the one, we was fearless. Go and look at Beach Street. What happened to spit and all of that? Like, <laughs> like that shit was real. Like niggas was dying. Police was stealing people's books, and now those same books today, police is is licensing them out to art galleries in in Stad and Minsk, and these people and they paying millions of dollars for art that they was killing us for. You understand? Like Banksy. Like who gives a fuck about Banksy? You understand? You know how many Banksies I knew growing up? Who are way better, who are way, who took way, would take way more chances than this, than this dude. Like I said, you can't have a Banksy if you didn't have Futura 2000. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, you wouldn't have none of these things. I remember in like sixth grade, they had a hip hop book that you could get at the library, B. Who, who printed that? They had a hip hop, I remember them had, they had like a rap dictionary when I was like 10, 12, like who's doing this? It wasn't for us, cause we making the slang up. By the time the dictionary came out, we already saying, we been stopped saying fresh. Fresh <laughs> the fly way. We wasn't saying none of that no more. We you was on the saying shit like dope and 
You know what I'm saying? Do you and you know what I'm saying and stuff like that. Like we wasn't by the time you write the stuff down, we was already ahead. So they had to they had to get us to to hate on it. They had to get us to hate it. So what they did was they got a bunch of pimps and a bunch of whores in the game and they they bigged up their version of rap more than everybody else. And like I said, anchored the black MC with criminality. You see what I'm saying? And then brought them down. And then when he's coming down, the female comes down. And then boom, now the children is waking up and all of that. And then by the time Drake come now, you know, we we get Snoop. And then it's really on. Then it's on. Then after, by the time Snoop come, it's a wrap. <laughs> it's, it's over. It's nothing but profanity laced rap. And sexualized rap. That's what it's about. And he excelled at the pimp culture thing to the point where this nigga believed it to the point where he was actually doing it in real life, pimping on his wife. His wife was like, nigga, you taking this too far. <laughs> but no, because like I said, all of these guys are morally bankrupt anyway. That's why they are allowed to be your entertainers. You can't have entertainers with integrity because if you do, they got to get them out of here. Arthur Ashe is out of here. Lacoste is out of here. You understand? Niggas that's trying to really do something in that, they out of here. You understand? They're not going to, you know, they'll they'll let, they'll give you a Jay-Z. You know what I'm saying? They'll let you do that. And they'll mythalize him. And we watch them. We watch them. We, the hip-hop culture, we watch them literally take the ones that we like kill them and then prop up the ones that the ones we like was was dissing and now we gotta like them <laughs> like these people are dirty man and the ones that's left is the ones that sold everybody out that's just what it is you know what i'm saying and there's no there's no redemption for yeah. those that had integrity, you know what I'm saying? Right. Speak, speaking of no integrity, Diddy. Um, <laughs> you said Diddy. Yeah, <laughs> one word <laughs> describe no integrity. Word. So we we rec so there's a lot going on in this this year on the 50 year anniversary. One thing I saw, and it kind of kind of caught my attention is how a lot of these rappers. Uh, producers, et cetera, they're selling their masters. Now, I thought that was interesting because when you look at the 50 year, first off, I've never seen the um, this happen with any other genre right. of music, the way they, they focused on hip hop this year, even with the Grammy thing and everything. But I saw where a lot of these artists, they're selling their masters in publishing. And then... On the flip side, you have Diddy saying he's giving his artists their publishing when it, it really ain't worth nothing anymore. Uh, Mark Curry called him out on that. Um, from, from your perspective, like, and even with the thing with Keefe D, I thought that was just strange. I want you to get into that because yeah, I just found funny. out he, he put out a whole book about this thing back in 2019 called Compton yeah. Street Legend. Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but I'm now they knock them up. So what's your take on this whole situation with um so-called brother love now? I first met Puffy at uh the Adam Clayton Powell State Building after they first made it. There was a uh my father was a uh organizer for the event they had there. And it was called, what was it called? Hip hop? No, it was it was Sisters in the Name of Rap because it, I was DJing for Trouble's Little Sister at the time, a, a girl named Nikki, Nikki Kicks. And it was at the Apollo, but they had a, a show like before that. And he was there, and at the time he was down, he was dancing with a group called the Wise Guys. 
and um from then from that point uh i had met another sister named uh kim green big up to kim green through through dj spinner and, them. and she used to work at columbia so um at the time i was interning at flavor unit records so i would be up at columbia and they were distributed by columbia i think at the time so i would have to go from grove street in jersey to um columbia in midtown you know so often bringing stuff back you know promotional stuff and all that so this is around the time where they just got the label popping so they had like freddie fox uh rotten rascals um somebody some other people i don't remember um and um at the time puffy had just started the whole big mac thing and they were running it through mca because charles my father back in the days when uptown started we had the first record like like they had like a group record with where heavy d was on it woody rock was on it ruby chill was on it they had a video for it. it was like launching the label it was like their version of the young money thing so at the time i remember that and then puffy was just starting work on andre at the time so when i found out that he was actually coming out with an artist and you know this was going to be his thing i always thought it was weird because he never really seemed like the type like he could throw a party but so long story short, by the time I see this dude become what he become, you dig? I start to see like, okay, a lot of these guys come into this game from criminal means because the the music industry is based on criminality. You understand? Like most of the people who are involved with it come from some sort of nefarious position. Just like if you notice, most people on TV. If you start to really get into their backstories, they they are like hardcore criminals. So, Misery Love Company, Birds with Feather flock together. So all these guys are on the same level. You understand? So, by the time now this guy's talking about publishing, and we start learning about publishing and masters, what you gotta understand is that after a certain amount of time, you're gonna get your masters back anyway. After 35 years or whatever, they revert back to the original creator in any way. That's why a lot of artists don't sweat it. But what happens is when it comes time for you to get them, if somebody then try to option it from out under you, that's what happened to Taylor Swift with Scott Braun, with Scott a, S Scooter, yeah, Scooter Braun, who um, basically took all of her publishing right when she was about to buy it all back. And he was her manager, but he didn't tell her. He locked it up, put it into a trust and all that. So all the swifties hate this nigga you know what i'm saying behind that but this is the same thing jay-z and all of that do you know that when tupac died the jay-z bought his publishing which is why he could do the bonnie and clyde shit like this is the type of stuff they do like you know this dude hated you and all of that he ain't like you he knew you was faking all that and then what do you do you mock him that's the freemason shit you mock him in death by taking something from him and then using it for yourself anyway much like the so-called Illuminati did to Andrew Jackson when they finally put his face on the $20 bill after his whole life, he fought against them from doing that. So um, the publishing, the real problem is that all of these guys are selling their publishing to foreigners. You understand? They're selling their publishing to a bunch of Arabs, a bunch of Chinese people, and a bunch of Norwegians. You know what I'm saying? Who ain't really gonna do nothing with it? Who just gonna pass it back and forth with each other? And they don't even really want it. They just want to keep us from owning anything because everybody has been feeding off of our multifaceted carcass for the past 250 years. So why would they stop now? So he could give them back the publisher now because it ain't worth nothing. You dig what I'm saying? And he can um, create a, 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 a fund or whatever he want to do with Keefe D and all them because he know he was involved with it. Because they always involved with it. 
because they all serve the same demon. You understand what I'm saying? These people serve an evil, malevolent force that manifests itself through good music. So we can't expect these people to do anything lawfully or altruistically. We have to accept what we like about it and keep it moving. That's the way you can appreciate something and not fall victim to it because man is becomes the fool for the divinity that he worships. So whatever you worship is worshiping you. Whatever you idolize is idolizing you. And Puffy never had no talent. Matter of fact, Biggie didn't have no talent. Y'all, we all know now that Biggie stole his whole thing from, from the real Biggie Smalls. Well, two Biggie Smalls. The notorious B.I.G. from Mississippi that he stole the name from and Juicy from. And then the white Biggie Smalls. There was a white boy named Biggie Smalls who was cool with Tupac. And he stole that. And he had to send notorious B.I.G. Biggie Smalls a cease and desist letter. That's why he started calling himself the notorious B.I.G. Because they stole this identity. That wasn't his identity. That's the identity that he was supposed to have in order for him to be who he is. So now we can always say that Biggie is the best. But listen to the things that Biggie rapped about, man. He was a psychopathic maniac. <laughs> he was a maniac. You understand what I'm saying? He was saying some wild stuff. And it was cool on some punchline stuff back in the days. But now I'm listening to it like... He wasn't doing nothing different than they doing now. He talking the same crazy shit Sexy Red talking. He talked about raping dudes with brooms and all types of Like, this dude was wild. <laughs> he was wild. You understand what I'm saying? However, some of it made for real good music. You know what I'm saying? Like, Party and Bullshit was one of the best songs I think has ever made. Because it captured the era. Like, I grew up in that era. So everything he talked about, I lived it. You did. Like, I remember seeing him perform at the Muse, and the whole thing went crazy, and everybody, we thinking they fighting. To the point, niggas in the audience was about to start fighting. And then he stopped, and then, can we just all get along? It was like, we went crazy. We had never seen nothing like that. <laughs> and what was it? He was just acting. So that's what I'm saying. Like, we, like everything that is a value of the music is really what you put on it. What you value about the music is where you were and how you felt when you first heard the song. You don't really care about the artist. The artist is just there to mold you into what the society wants you to be. Because the artist is a demon. You understand what I'm saying? Because the artist don't exist. And the real artists that find this out and then want to rebel, they got to get rid of them. Fife. Look, Fife. For, every, for all of the years we was listening to Tribe. Everybody thought that Q-Tip was the, was the best rapper. But when you really listen to it, Fife was better. See what I'm saying? Yeah. But we didn't, real, we didn't figure that out until Fife dead and Michael Rappaport made that horrible hit piece um, documentary on it. Right? Same thing with, with De La Soul. Soon as we find out, you know what? Dave was pretty wild. He, he out of here. Soon as they get their masters back, next week, Dave out of here. That's that's just coincidence. That's why why is it that when every any so called black artist, melanated artist, and I say black as a euphemism, as all the Moors listening know, but you gotta understand we still live amongst the Gentiles in eighty five, so they they gonna call themselves that, so whatever. So they um as great as they are, they continuously do the same thing. They perpetuate the same thing. When the last time you heard a really innovative artist, really innovative, that wasn't based on a gimmick? You don't even know. You don't even know. <laughs> you don't even know. When the last time you actually listened to one album all the way through? You don't do that. You don't do that anymore. When the last time you actually held, they done made it so you can't even touch the music no more. You can't even touch the CD. You got to go out your way to get a physical media. They're trying to get rid of all physical media now. Where well, you just don't have nothing. Where everything is on some cloud that they control. And y'all going to let them do this? No, that's why you go back to doing CDs. That's why you go back to doing 
albums and stuff like that, force niggas to go back and get tape recorders and all of that. Like, I remember making beat tapes out of little snippets of music with two cassette tapes where I play one second of the beat and then pause it, play another second, pause it, do this for an hour. <laughs> do this for almost 45 minutes an hour. All to have one tape where the beat is is cut up so I can rap on it. You know what I'm saying? This is before MP60s. I'm doing this with with cassette tapes. You know what I'm saying? Like this is how innovative we were, because we didn't have nobody to teach us nothing. All our parents was at work. We latchkey kids. We we had daycare. We don't have nobody to teach us shit. We gotta figure all of this out for self. And we did. And we created an entire culture that took over the entire world. And before we could actually really do something with it, the, the traders amongst us sold us out, right? And then veered us on another path without telling us. That's why they all guilty of it. They all guilty of it. All of these niggas done been to one party. All of these niggas got something that they done been compromised with. But if they all came out together, See what I'm saying? If they all just divested from it together, then the vibration of the planet would raise up because that means everything that they've been telling us that we've been lying about. You understand? For 25 years, people have been telling me the shit that I've been saying is not real. And every day of them 25 years, it came out to be real. So those same people can't now come to me and say, you know what, you right. Or you know what? I was tripping, I was too invested because of what, they can't do that. So they just gotta separate. Cause that's how so-called black people do. They are too prideful. They're too unforgiving. They're too uh, uh, unconsolable. They don't like to admit they are wrong. You know what I'm saying? Well, that's not true. So-called black men in my experience in life, I've had more so-called melanated black men come to a point if we have an issue of conflict and actually say they wrong, then I have had women do that. You know what I mean? But it might be different for somebody else. All I'm saying is that accountability as a man is something you can't really shirk. At some point, you got to deal with it. Whereas women, they have the luxury of indecisiveness. So they don't ever have to really take accountability. And we as men can't really get upset at them for that. Because that's just how it is. You know what I'm saying? Um, and because they're trying to get rid of men altogether. You understand? Like real heterosexual men are the enemy of this modern society. If you're a heterosexual man and you don't want your child to be sodomized or you don't want things to happen to your children or be overly sexualized or you don't want your woman out there with OnlyFans and all this other type of stuff, you are their enemy. And the music is there to let you know. And who is the face of this music? These slut rappers. Right. See what I'm saying? Yep. But see, I came up where some of my favorite rappers was females. Like Infamous Syndicate, for instance. I was just listening to them the other day. They only had one album, Shauna and the other chick. But that that album bang. Like those nobody them chicks was crazy with the lyrics. Um, a lot of people I used to listen to, like uh, Lin Q and yeah, Lin Q, um, yeah. right? Lin Q. Um, I used to, used to like other like like light rap. I used to like old school chicks like Antoinette, like when she had the beef with MC Light. Yeah, yeah. Like Antoinette, right? I used to like her. I used to like Sweet Tea. Um, all of these chicks, beat. Some of them had I'm great. Who? Bahamadia? Yes. Can't forget her, Bahamadia. Yeah. Yep. You know what I mean? That was, that was like a whole summer one time listening to that album. Um, a lot of female rappers beat, like a lot, that were really good, that had nothing to do with me thinking about them sexually. I think that's what I even liked about them, was that, you know, even the ones that was somewhat put in, like Yo-Yo, I, I was a big Yo-Yo fan. When I can't play with my yo-yo came out, that shit, it was like, it was dope. And what was she with? She was with the IBWC, right? 
the Intelligent Black Women Coalition. You see what I'm saying? Like, we came up with, who you calling a bitch? Remember with, with, with Latifah yep. and all of that? You know what I'm saying? Like, that shit was dope. That's when Winky, that's when they sacrificed Winky and shit. That's when he died. You know, that's when I just started learning about celebrity sacrifices and shit and how so many people, when people come celebrities, somebody always dying around them and shit that they love. So that's when I started really understanding what that stuff was about. And the fact that this whole game, like I said, is ran by the demon, man. By extra dimensional entities that learn how to communicate through certain frequencies and make things sound beautiful. They can make the hip hop can make the most raunchiest shit sound dope. Like, like, um, whatever, man. Like, 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 uh, Snoop Dogg in them. Um, Women ain't ish. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, yeah. perfect example. Yeah. No matter as conscious and everything as I am, as we all are, the minute you hear that breakdown in the beginning, you know what it is. You, you bugging in the club. What are you crazy? Soon as that breakdown come on. What? You, come on now. Come on now. So does that make us hypocritical? Maybe. However, I never listened to that song and then looked at every woman like they wasn't that, like they was that. You know what I mean? Like I know that we know the difference. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Women would be singing the song. They know the difference. Oh, he ain't talking about me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that's what I mean. So we have discernment. So at what point? Did now the women decide, okay, well, now he talk, I, I'm going to be that. He is, I'm not only is he talk about me, I'm going to make more records where I'm de deflowering myself. I'm dehumanizing myself in excess now. So were we ever really exploiting them then? Because it seems like this is what they always wanted to do. Because ain't no so-called black women coming out against them, right? I'm talking about in mass. I mean, I see certain little TikTok joints or whatever, but for the most part, they go into the Sexy Red concerts. They go into the Lotto concerts. They they go into all of the slut rap stuff. They support that. They think that's empowerment. They got these women, they got these women promoting STDs like they sneakers. <laughs> like, like it's a brand to get. That, oh, nah, bro, I got that gonorrhea. Nah, you should get the syphilis. Like, this this how they talking now. This one talking about she gonna have lipstick with them names on it. Yellow piss and gonorrhea. Can you imagine little girls going to the lipstick counter? Yeah, let me get that gonorrhea. Let me get that piss color <laughs> lipstick. This is what they want. So where's the so-called mothers, intelligent so-called black women that's standing up against this stuff? Where they at? Can you imagine if I was a teacher in school and I brought my class to attention by singing uh, Bishes Ain't Ish? <laughs> Can you imagine what they would do to me? Yet, you could have this teacher, so-called black woman, right? S reciting sexy red songs to get all her children in line. And this is what you're paying for. And you wonder why these children don't know nothing. It's beyond, it's beyond dummy down education now. Now you just totally just, you just don't even care. You'll do anything. Now. So my suggestion, homeschool your children. <laughs> Word, because it ain't going to get no better. No, no. Yeah. And you can tell when you even see the interviews of these rappers. Yeah. It, you, I swear at least 80% of them went to special ed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's, 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 that's how they, like, Glorilla, I could see that. But a lot of these shorties, a lot of these shorties come from two-parent homes, like Chrissy Arn. She came from a good home. She went to a good school. They sent her to college. She was on all types. These, these shorties be fronting, son. Wow. A lot of these girls, 
be coming from real Ivy League parents. They, they'd have been a Jack and Jill, Boule, all of that. And they just act like this. Like a lot of the rappers that you see is not even American. Half of these dudes is not even from here that got people from here acting like them, making us think that that's so-called hip hop or so-called black culture. And that's just some made up shit that they're acting because that's how they think. Look at 21 Savage. Right. Yeah, that's true. Look at, look, half of them, they not even from here. I mean, they like maybe first generation American. ASAP Rocky, he from, from Bahamas. Rahana, she from Trinidad or wherever. What you call it? Cool Herc, he from Jamaica. And they going to tell me that he invented it? No, he did not invent hip hop. Hip hop did not start in Bronx. It started in Bronxdale. Everybody know that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But again, you got revisionists trying to rewrite history, put themselves in it. So now they get to tell you what it is today. No, you don't. You don't, because I was there. I was there as a young shorty trying to get up in Latin quarters. And they looking at me, paradise at the door, looking at me like, what the hell are you doing here? You a baby. Get this nigga back home. Like this, the time. You, you understand what I'm saying? So it's funny when you be seeing these people with all of this fake history shit and trying to like revamp it to give themselves a story in it, and they don't. They want us to go with Cool Herc and Bambada so that way we can say that West Indians started hip hop, but that's not the case. Dance hall and reggae don't have nothing to do with hip hop, B. Right. Stop with that shit too. Kill that noise too, B. Dance yeah. hall was different. Yep. Okay, I remember because I was going. I remember when dance hall was called Rockers. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because right. I was in the Rockers party listening to Major Macro and and Super Cat and Junior Cat and and Yellow Sanchez Man. and Beanie Man and the rest of them at Juve on on things. So it's like they be really acting like that's why they don't like no history. That's why I don't like talking to people like us because because I know you can't tell me. We was there, okay? We were there. <laughs> and there was none of y'all there when we was there. <laughs> so so that's it, B. That's it, I'm not trying to diss you. You could talk about it now. And you could gentrify it and move into the shit now, but I was there when it was a weed spot, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Now it's a Whole Foods. Cool, that's cool. But it don't change the fact that if it wasn't a weed spot, it wouldn't be a Whole Foods one day. You see what I'm saying? So there's a there's a step down when it comes to the logic and respect that I don't feel that people have that they want to kind of overwrite with this new fake reset history shit they're trying to do. Yeah. But it ain't going to work. No, no. The, um, they don't talk about um, Mario, Disco King Mario, the Bronx Yeah. Nope. Like they don't, they don't even want Mario, to talk about Romeo. Right. They don't talk about Romeo. They don't talk about um, Starsky. You know yeah, Starsky, they don't talk yeah. about none of them. They don't talk about none of the ones that was really out there like rapping, like like even even Cold Crush. I I had that tape, the Cold Crush versus the um Furious Five and all that. He like, our you know it's it's crazy, man. So like you said, by the time Wu Tang came, that was it. That's when they started phasing all of the Moors, all of the Muslims out of hip hop. And then they started ushering in the New York version of N NWA era. That was the 50 Cent era. But in all of these eras, there was no Jay-Z era. <laughs> Jay-Z ain't never had no era with his own, where he was doing something. No. There was the 50 Cent era. There was the Little Wayne era. There was the, uh, what you call it, era. The, the Tribe era. Right? Uh, the Buster era. Uh... Cash Money era, De La Soul era. Well, that's the native tongue era. So that all, they all kind of get the same in that. We're, there was no Jay-Z era. <laughs> there was none. There was the Tupac era. There was the Biggie era. <laughs> like, we're, we're, he was like the tail end. And his era got, got, got literally ethered. You know what I'm saying? Like any, any, you could say whatever you want to say about Jay Z. You could say, well, you could have that whole museum library dedicated to him. You know what I gotta? Do? All I gotta do is walk to the front of that place with a boombox and play Ether. The whole thing is done. <laughs> it's all over. It's all over. 
I don't care what you got in there. I don't care how many busts you got in his hands and his, his hair and his, his, you know what I'm saying? His, his, his toenails and all of the shit y'all got in there with this nigga. I don't care let's about not, none of that. Once let's he not come on, that's it. Yep. You're putting your head down and you're leaving. And yep. Nas, this this why this why my bone with Nas is the fact that, and then Nas is so fake humble because it's fake humble. He a Virgo B. Come on now, <laughs> you know, you know it's on forever. You know that. So stop always giving this dude a pass to always shit on you, and then you always got to be the good person. That's how you know it's some Freemason other shit going on with these people. Cause there's no way you talking about leaving condoms on my baby mother baby seat and we being cool after that. There's no way we're not. How how can you be cool with somebody that ethered you? And remember, Jay is a sag, so he's net. He think about that every day. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> you understand? Every time Nas' name come up, anything dealing with anything like that, he think about this nigga every. Day. Them sadges don't get over shit like that. Are you crazy? And the thing is, Nas know it. But Nas, he gonna he gonna play like, oh well, we cool now. And, and I, you just gonna let him pick at you for the rest of your life. That's what you gonna do? No. You needed to do an ether two <laughs> right now. You understand? If that nigga was to drop an ether two right now, what that would do for rap? Yeah. With all of the bullshit this nigga Jay done done. If this nigga was to do an ether two right now, bro, the whole game would just rise. You understand? And and the Brooklyn Music Library just collapsed. That should be, just be done. <laughs> just be done because it's all fake, man. It's all idolatry. It's all scam. I don't trust nobody that can't. I don't, I don't trust none of them. You know what I mean? And in the end, I just feel like it's funny that now in the 50 years of rap, everybody talking about, oh, niggas shouldn't rap no more, whatever. But the only people selling out shows is the elders. And all these young niggas, they don't have no money. They can't have no shows, nothing. All they show is being canceled because it's we're at the end of it now. It's at the end. The next female rapper come out, she's going to have to straight have sex on, on the screen. She's going to have to do something. She's going to have to... What are you going to do to top Sexy Red now? What you going to do? You, yeah. you got to do something. Yeah. It's crazy. It is absolutely crazy, man. And what I'm looking at, you mentioned about Jay. I don't, I don't want to forget, when Jay was out, he could never outshine DMX. Never. That's what I said. I forgot that DMX era. The yes. Rough Rider era, the Locks era. When was exactly. there ever a Jay Z era? Never. never, right? Never, never. It never happened. Y'all niggas is remaking history. I never thought he was that good. I always thought he was rapping based on whoever he was around. When he was with Original Flavor, he was dumb fast, right? When he was with Chinkin' Him, Skiing Him, I had the original Original Flavor record. The, the test pressing thing, because they sent me to do a review on the album. And I was like, he's cool, but he rap, he trying to rap too much like them. And he stole their style. We're original flavor now. You see what I'm saying? Yep. <laughs> we're Jazzo now. See what I'm saying? Yep. We're, we're Big L now. See what I'm saying? Yep. We're DMX now. See what I'm saying? It's, oh, we're Prodigy now. All of these people. Yep. But, he, but this is who we left with. Him and Puffy, whatever, man. Yeah, I I remember, I remember Jazzo. I used to see Jazzo in Brooklyn in Bushwick because I yes. used to go out to the Hall of Knowledge. Yes, that's when he was an answer. He all was eyes mad, on Egypt. All yep, all eyes on Egypt. Ten to Kedar, all that. He was mad cool, and I knew that Jay Z. I never seen him, but I knew that from watching the videos. Like he brought him up. You catch what I'm saying? Yeah. He, was, he used was. to be at the tab and all that. Jay-Z used to be at the tab, too. Jay-Z used to be at the tab. Yeah. Um, Doom and them. And then oh, yeah, Doom. Doom Daniel. Daniel. Bless the Dead. I, I mean, that, yeah, absolutely. Yep. KMD, man. Bless the Dead. Him and Sub Rock, man. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of my 
another great group, man. And then he look at look at what Doom was able to do. Revamped his shit where you wouldn't even know if it was the if it was really him rapping. He created an entire mythos where there's a whole subreddit section where people think that he he not even dead. He just somewhere else. Because he would have people impersonate him. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> like this is what I'm saying. Like niggas literally turn themselves into superheroes. We become we we are literal gods. And we don't see it, man. And it'd be the little G gods. It'd be the little ones that be trying to come around and trying to act like they they the ones when they're really just the, the ones that slow the culture down enough to allow all of the dullards now to come in now and feel like now because, you know, they rapping now or whatever. You know, it's a world culture now. No, that's the problem. Y'all did the same thing with jazz. Y'all did the same thing with rock and roll. Y'all did the same thing with, with classical. Everything we create, our niggas come in and the half-breeds and hybrids come in, flip it up, and then try to charge us entry fees for the shit. Like, that's what they do. Why? Because we don't never own it. Because as soon as we perfect it, whatever, we on to the next. This is the first era we haven't created a whole nother genre of thing yet to replace what's already dead. But what I think is happening is that it's creating a resurgence of real rap music, of real hip-hop music amongst real Real hip hop people. Like there's certain rap there's certain people who are doing extremely well, but you wouldn't know about them because people don't promote them on the mainstream. But I listen to them all the time. People like um like currency. You yeah. know what I mean? Perfect example, yo. Most of his records are like art pieces. Yeah. So it's shit I'm listening to every other day I'm finding a new currency mixtape. So it's always something new. And it's always within the same genre of, of subject matter. What? We, cars, money, stunting on dudes or whatever. But it's cool because that's what he do. <laughs> I'm not expecting him to make, you know what I'm saying? But then every once in a while he drops something, you know what I'm saying, thing. But his music to me is like hip-hop lounge music. Like you could just leave it on. You know what I'm saying? And it all be good. It may not always be what I'm, you know, with best lyrics or whatever. However, it's a standard that he set. So I always know a currency joint when I hear it. And I know I'm going to like it for the most part. Same thing with some of these other ones that's coming up, you know. But then some of them, you know, they just all over the place. Like West Side of them is cool, but, you know. But they, they followed after Rock Marciano, like Rock. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Rock, though, that's the man. Yeah. They all follow Rock. You know what I'm saying? And uh, Rock, I, I, I like Rock Marciano a lot. I like him. I like even um Brooklyn Car, like Car. Yeah. Brownsville Car. Yep. Yeah, man. Brownsville Car. Like, he dope. Uh, Cold Facts, that's one of my favorites of his. Yeah. And, um, yeah, more like just the ones that 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 are consistent about what they want to do. Ones who could like turn a thing into thing. And that's what I started doing. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna just start doing music. When me and the Queen uh was doing music, we was like, you know what, I'ma do them as like soundtracks to other stuff we do. So like I wrote a book. So we did a whole album which is like a soundtrack to the book. You know what I mean? And then um thinking like, okay, well, when I come out with projects like this, that's what I'm going to do. I'm a theme them and then come out with musical aspects to the literary and the visual stuff I'm doing. So now my stuff has like a context that is multifaceted. You could be reading my joint and then listening to the joint at the same time. You know what I mean? But systematically, it's another way of expression and it gives me more of a canvas to do stuff with. You know? Yeah. Dope. Definitely. So, so that's what I'm saying, like different ways of, of, of reinventing what we perfected to make it new again to us. Mm -hmm. Because like I said, our generation gonna be the generation to save humanity. It ain't gonna be yeah. these young these these ones, they too dependent on the system. They basically communists. <laughs> these kids <laughs> today, they basically commies, yo. So we can't even trust them. And then the, the ruling class of so-called black leadership, they all 
bankrupt, morally bankrupt Marxists and and sodomites. So you know, yeah, we can't do nothing with them. So it's really just us and um, those of us that subscribe to the same type of um, ideologies. Right. Indeed. Indeed. William Bay said, "Shay Noor." Oh, I forgot about her. She's dope too. Shay Noor. Shay Noor. Yeah, uh, she's cool. She, she, she's she's tight. Oh, um, I was saying, um, you, you spoke about earlier. You made a statement about they all come out of the same parties, or they all went to the same parties. Um, you also talked about hearing those rumors, like the Chris Stokes and the um, African Bambadas. Yeah. I've heard recently about what they call, and I, we've all heard about the rituals, but the, the term that I've heard recently was the humiliation rituals. Yes. Can you speak to that and speak a little bit on that? Uh, yes. Every time, everything that they do, every, every level in the pyramid that they climb is to eventually reach the top of the bottom because they're right they're climbing the ladder to the top of the bottom of hell you understand so when you reach the 33 degrees up then it's 33 degrees below and it's what they call the tabernacle that's the hidden aspect of the mind or the temple or the body so these people believe in a ritual called called the tunnels of Typhon. And they believe that after you go through a, a alchemical wedding, now the dirty high pedophile ones, um, they take a little boy and they marry the boy and then they consecrate the wedding because they believe that the way to immortality is through the sphincter of uh, a youth. This is based on an older Greco, so-called Grecas uh, practice called uh, pedestry, um, where they take the youth, the boy, and basically marry him to a man. And then when he becomes a man, they practice what they call agape, love. And so they believe that the way to immortality is to imbue your essence into that child because then what happens is the essence that is implanted into the child becomes literally a part of the child's DNA. This is what they believe. And then in that, whenever you want to reinvigorate yourself in the world, you can access the world via the child. So every time the child thinks about the traumatic act, you now are manifest, you see what I'm saying, uh, in this plane or whatever plane you're at. So it's a way to always be able to look in. So basically the more children you do this to, the more portals you have to look into different realities once you disincorporate from here. You understand? This is what they believe. This is what they practice. Uh, this is written about in the Book of the Law by Alistair Crowley. Uh, Elifus Levy talked about this. Manly P. Hall talked about this. All the degenerate masters of what they refer to as the craft of Freemasonry, which is really Luciferianism, which itself, the word Lucifer is even still something not even really real like that, but that's just another nomenclature that they give for these ancient deities that they're serving, which are the same ones that our ancestors fought against and shut down, such as Molech, uh, Semiramis, uh, Ashtaroth, Ishtar, all of these so-called deities and so-called goddesses that our people mistakenly want to identify with and associate with through things like witchcraft and shit thinking that they understand what they're dealing with and they really don't because they don't know the origin of these things and how these things came to be. So they think they're giving them names and they're controlling them, but they're doing the opposite. But I digress. So once they do that to the child, um, this is them being able to constantly do that. So they created an entire network to keep this priesthood going. You see what I'm saying? 
And so the music industry is laden with these people. Because remember, the, the, the story of Lucifer was that he was the, the morning star and he was the lord of all the musicians. So allegedly the inside of its body represents all of, is shaped like all of the instruments in the world. And so um, through the music industry, this is how they do it. So one of the main ways that they bring you into the, the fray to one day be able to hopefully be in a ritual where you are uh, SA'd, right? They have to get to see how far you're willing to go. So this is where the humiliation ritual comes in, where they make you dress up like a woman or they make you do something that's contrary to your innate character and morals. If you can do that, then they can trust you with something else. But then once they trust you with that thing, then you got to do another humiliation ritual. See, they keep telling you, like, when you sell your soul, like, that's it. But the thing is, you got to keep selling. Because they know at any given point, you could finally just give, throw up your hands and ask for redemption. You know what I'm saying? To your higher self, which itself is the Christ or whatever. And you fulfill that and receive that and be free from that. So they got to constantly make you do so many things, so many horrible things that you just can't come back from that. Like, uh, like Sukiana, you know what I'm saying? Seemed like a nice girl. She know about the Moors and all of that. However, she has put herself to such a, to such a level that she's beyond the point of no return in terms of like being taken seriously as anything outside of uh, of what she presents herself as. You know what I'm saying? And then that is what creates the disparaging nature between the male and the female. It's like these females won't let you respect them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like they, they won't let you look at them as, as respectable. You know what I'm saying? Because that's not what's hot right now. And unfortunately, they're very impressionable. Yes. Yeah. Now, you, you, uh, yeah, I, I would definitely say that because to that point, when you see a lot of these, the younger generation of women out here in particular, and like you said, we've all, in every generation, you've always had that section of women who were more, we would consider scandalous or provocative, but now it's, it's, to the point where in the mainstream that is put as the standard. Yeah, you know, that's the you, standard now. Yeah. If you're not doing that, something's wrong with you. Exactly. If exactly. you don't have a BBL, beaver eyelashes, uh baby hairs that touch your eyebrows, uh long uh dagger nails, right? Dagger nails, the BBL. The Gucci the Louis the Prada, if you don't got none of that, you're not even a female. If you're the type of female that doesn't look like a, a transgender, then you're not considered a woman. <laughs> because who's making all of the clothes and all of that now for these women? Gay men, right? And transgender men. So they're trying to turn you into what they want you to look like. But you'll take that so long as you that spites me me being the proverbial man you know what i'm saying yeah and that's the problem like in the industry it should be accepted that that most of those men are are with the the rituals with this our sodomites basically you know what i'm saying and if that's what they want to do that's what they're going to do it's not my business however it is my business when you promote this man in front of me, like he's supposed to be an example for me and my son and other men and other this and other that, and you try to make it seem like he's this big, this big stud with other women, and this dude is out here pounding every dude he could get, Dwight Howard. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so if that's the case, then that means they all on it like that. Why wouldn't they be? What, it's just him? That's, that's what we think it. We're going to make it like it's just him. When he on a team with all y'all niggas, all y'all niggas be in the, um, the showers, right, with him. <laughs> y'all be in the showers with him. Y'all be in the locker room with him. Y'all be naked with him. 
So let's stop just putting it all on him because y'all decided to out him. You dig? Like, this is what y'all are on because all of that's Greco-Roman shit. All of that is all of that. You know what I mean? And all of that is, if that's what y'all want to do, cool. But let's stop acting like we don't know that this is how they all get down because they do. So let's stop looking at them as the pinnacle of what masculinity is and go back to looking at things that really matter. Real men in our family, like our fathers, our sons, our uncles, our grandfathers, people we see every day actually doing things to help us. Those are real men. You understand? The man that got the nine to five job and go home to the woman that's constantly on his back about how he don't make enough money. You know what I mean? And he doing everything that he can to hold on and not just snap and kill everybody. That's the man that we need to be applauding. That's the one that we need to be standing up for because he's the backbone of America, of the world, of any country he's in, no matter what color he is, <laughs> because they want all of us gone. If you have a penis, and you are heterosexual, you're the enemy, period. No matter what color you are, it just so happens to be that this shade makes it even more of the case because they all want us. They all want our seed. You understand? How else they gonna make the new, the new Trey songs or the new, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Trick Daddy or R. Kelly. It ain't gonna come from the hybrids. <laughs> it's gonna come from somebody that's full-blooded. Cause that's what it is you know what i'm saying so when i see melanated men or melanated women and they decided that they're gonna recreate themselves with somebody else and i'm looking at the family where now everybody up to you was dark skinned and black and that or melanated and now from you on everybody caucasian if that's what you want to do and you think that that represents you and color don't matter and this don't matter that's great allow yourself to get bleached out and go because the, the, it's not even the genetics anymore. It's the mentality. It's what is secreting out of the pineal organ. So if I'm a melanated black man and I'm, and I'm really upset about my complexion and I want to come back lighter, I'm going to try to promote myself and put myself somewhere with something lighter that don't look like me. That's me, but it's not necessarily phenotypical me. Where when I'm with the child, people think I'm the nanny or I'm kidnapping it. Meanwhile, Caucasian people could walk around here with any shade, baby, melanated baby, and nobody asks nothing. <laughs> this, this is what I'm saying. Yeah. This is the problem. So music is just a symptom of all of this stuff that we've basically said. You know, that's why we don't listen to none of the new stuff, really. No. I think the last new stuff we listened to was like Pop Smoke. Because he was reminiscent of that Brooklyn 50 Cent, you know what I'm saying? Melodical music. He could rap. He got his own style. And look what they did. Out of here. Yeah. Out of here. Vaughn, out of here. Remember up until a couple of months ago, like last year, it was a dead rapper every day. Yep. Absolutely. But why they do that? So that way this year they could come out with all of the slut rappers, all the female slut rappers now. And now they dying. They killing them now. They done killed a lot of Cash Death though. They done killed what's her name? Gangsta Boo Dead. What you call it dead? They 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 got women boxing now. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Look at Remy. Look at what happened with Remy. Look yeah. at that. She done messed it up for all of the women. Yep. <laughs> she done messed it up for all of them. For yep. all of y'all. That be really on that man versus woman steeds or whatever. You know? No, they don't. To the point you even got Ebony K. Williams talking about, yo, well, maybe we just need to slow down and, you know, we need not to have. So this was the chick bombing on us, hating on the men, saying that men ain't this and men ain't that. Nope, don't matter. Because <laughs> now we're reaching the, where the rubble meet the road. We're starting to see that all of this fake propaganda has led to nothing but the criminalization of women now. And guess what? 
they about to start the draft on niggas. <laughs> they about to start the draft on them. So you don't be surprised more. You're going to have hundreds of people hitting you up about their nationality because white men say he's going to send them off to Ukraine or, or Israel or Iran or wherever. So they're going to be looking like, yo, what can I do to not go? You hit me up now, Mo. <laughs> <laughs> I already know it's about to agree. You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, I told him. When COVID started, everybody was going crazy. I'm giving people exemptions. People like, yo, the exemption not working, blah, blah, blah. So give it a while. I'm telling you, none of this shit going to work. They going to have to shut it down. Then they started talking a couple of months ago. They started talking about, yo, they talking about bringing the COVID back and the lockdown back. I said, no, they not. They just talking to you. They trying to get as many people to believe it so they can make it true. Every time you hear some shit like that, if you choose not to believe it, if you choose not to engage and give your physical, mental, spiritual energy to it, it can't affect you. It can't. We are cleaving the spiritual earth from the physical earth. They separate it. And as that separation happens, some of us is just going to phase out of stuff. There's people right now in your life that you don't even remember right now who, who you don't even remember, who be calling you, who be reaching out to you, and you don't even remember they exist. Right now, all your listeners, same thing. You got people contacting you right now that you used to know all of that. You don't even remember they existed. Cause they don't exist in your reality anymore. So if you could do that with stuff you're not thinking about, imagine what you could do with things that you are thinking about. That's why they took away the record players. That's why they took away all of that. All of that black vinyl, that black carbon tape, that brown carbon tape. We used to be having hard days and stuff and we could come back home, lay down, turn on the record player and just listen to Trouble Man or listen to, you know, uh, Curtis Mayfield or something and get healed by it. It actually healed us. So once they started seeing we was using this shit to heal each other, and then we, from healing each other from the late 60s to the early 70s, by the end of the 70s to the early 80s, we done now took them records that was healing us and found a way to make music with them. Who else did that? Whoever, whoever did that on the planet? Who did that? Wasn't no white man doing that. Wasn't no Asian doing that. Wasn't no Italian, Swedish. None of y'all. None of y'all. Who was doing that? Little, poor, melanated children who was living in a bombed out, benign neglect situation created that. So imagine the type of hip hop these niggas in Palestine could create right now. With all this going on with them. You see what I'm saying? Because we was basically in the same conditions. People forget the first bombing that they bombed people here in this country was in, in Oklahoma. But it happened in the 60s too. Remember in Philly? When the move yep. block, when the move movement, when they bombed the entire block in Philly? kill hundreds of people just to get rid of them because they wouldn't cut their dreadlocks. And who ordered the bombing? The so-called black mayor. But who gave him the ability to do all that? This is how scared they was with us. You understand? And so they then took the Black Panther and they then turned him into a superhero. So when you think of Black Panther, you don't even think about Huey Newton and these niggas anymore. You think about T'Challa. And they killed him. <laughs> and they killed him too. Killed him and then replaced him with a tranny. Cause I maybe maybe it's maybe sure he's a dude. Maybe sure he's a girl, but that looked like a dude to me. That's just me though. You know what I'm saying? I'm not trying to diss the actress Latita Wright, whatever her name. I ain't trying to diss you. I'm just saying. They you come off like a dude. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Sorry. And yeah, they killed him. And look what they did. They didn't kill Marvel, kill Star Wars, kill everything. Everything you like, these people don't came and destroy. Why? Because it was too heterosexual. <laughs> but it's okay. Like I said, the draft coming. 
The draft coming. You know how many people learned English by listening to hip hop tapes? Facts. I was at yeah. Japan. I went to Japan. Went to a club called Harlem in Japan. Wow. <laughs> and they all in there dressed like me. They all in there singing Tupac lyrics, word for word. Don't speak English at all. <laughs> singing most deaf lyrics. I'm there, I'm there in, in shock, like. And then while I'm there, I, I look, I like peer in the club and I'm look and I'm like, wait a minute. And I get up, go to the other side. It's another brother doing the same thing to me, looking like, I know that ain't no, <laughs> that ain't no boy here. <laughs> go up to the wall, hey, what's going on, brother? Boom, come to find out this nigga, he, he from Flatbush. I'm from Crown Heights. We done met in, in Shibuya. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? In a club called Harlem, tripping off the same shit. Like, wow. Watching the shorties with the door knockers, watching these niggas with the polo gooses. And, but they Japanese. Talking about, hey, what's up? Word. This is how they talking to me. Like, pointing to their clothes. Like, like words, right? Like, this is dope, right? Like, this is how you do it, right? This is what I'm saying. But what? But but I come from them? No. <laughs> no. No. That's crazy. That's crazy. So it, yeah, man. We all we all that's left. We humanity's last hope, man. Yeah. That's facts. That's facts. But brother, I appreciate your time, man. Um you. you always drop it. Always drop it. And um and again, everybody support our brother Sid the Duke of Tears. Keep on, guys. I appreciate that, man. Cash app, dollar sign, DS418. Indeed. Uh, check also, if guys want to check out, um, it'll probably be uh, by the end of the month, but you'll be able to check the Google Play Store. Just check me back on my YouTube page. Um, it's under I see the Duke of Tears. I have some new stuff up there. I just went through it back and forth with them. I put up a new video. They took it down. I appealed it. They put it back. Then I woke up this morning, they took it down. I peeled it again, they had to put it back. So hopefully it's there. But I would say, however, uh, definitely please support because they don't monetize my stuff on, on YouTube like that. And they always shadow banning me and stuff. I've been on for almost 10 years. They got me capped at 50,000 <laughs> subscribers almost. So any, every little bit helps. Uh, if you wanna donate there, you can donate there or to, um, PayPal to Duke of Tears at gmail.com. But definitely check out the Apple Play Store and the Google Play Store because I'm going to have a, my app up. It's called A Dot. I see the Duke of Tears. And it'll be an app that you'll be able to uh, download to your iPhone, your Android. And uh, you'll be able to get updates from a lot of the stuff that I can't post, a lot of the older stuff, a lot of older lectures from me and some of the elders that's not even alive no more. I'm going to have one there. Um, so definitely check that out. And then I got a graphic comic book novel coming out called uh, The Dark Skull 418. So you might want to check out ds418.com. Um, I'm going to have a link through the app and all of that so people can check it out. Also, please check me out on Rumble under rossierjupiteers.com. And um, I'm trying to think of what else. Uh, definitely honors and praise to the prophet, um, to all his temples. To all of the Moors, um, you know what I'm saying? Whether declared or undeclared, whether temple or culture or whatever division y'all y'all on, I just want to give love and respect because that's our people. And the Asiatic Covenant says we when we out here and amongst the world, we're not supposed to put others before our own. So, inshallah, you know, I definitely want to give thanks and praise to the community for supporting me all of these years. And uh, seeing, you know, how I've strived to stay away from a lot of the stuff that a lot of the people I came up with in some of those other platforms, you see why I uh, <laughs> stepped away from them very early due to a lot of the, the, the tomfoolery that a lot of these Freemasons posing as liberators was down with. 
So thank you to the people who were supporting me and supporting the queen from then and seeing, you know, what we've uh, been striving to do out here all these years, you know? Indeed, indeed, brother. And I appreciate everything that you do. I appreciate you always being, um, always giving your time and always being accommodating with me. That that means the world to me, brother. I um, appreciate that, man. Absolutely. We got, you know, we got to support, man. So anytime I see more, so I'm going to do something or anybody that's, especially if they melanated, you know what I mean? Indeed. Um, we got to, we got to do what we got to do. Cause like I said, we are the real, truest Americans that could ever exist. And we are what our forefathers and ancestors were <clears throat> without any doubt or contradiction. So we're here because they were. So if we can do what we need to do to support, and if I can support your platform, any other platform like that, that's really about the work. Let's do it, man, because time is of the essence, you know? Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely appreciate it. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Johnny Johnny Boyd for the donation. Great build, the great build, definitely. And um, to you, Moors, I, I want to say everybody, everybody, uh, no matter what, uh, where you, uh, what your your organization, where you come from, your perspective. I appreciate everybody coming on, checking us out. I want to say, as my brother also said, highness to our prophet. Dude. Peace to all you Moors. Indeed. Peace to all sincere mores. Peace and love to everybody. Until that, peace. Peace. <laughs>